I'm Laura Lucas Magnuson, and this is The World Unpacked. A Joe Biden presidency will treat Africa with respect and seek to negotiate rather than dictate terms of engagement. This is according well, The Electoral Commission in Uganda has announced the final result from Thursday's election, declaring incumbent President Yoweri Museveni the winner. The 76-year-old is one of the world's longest-serving leaders. His main challenger, singer-turned-lawmaker Bobby Wine, is accusing Museveni of fabricating the results, calling the poll the most fraudulent in the history of Uganda. This week, the U.S. military began drawing down in Somalia as part of President Trump's vow to reduce overseas deployments. Some 700 U.S. troops have been training Somali forces, but now they will have to do that mission from elsewhere. And as there are 15 candidates in Somalia's indirect election for president, and with the clans choose members of parliament who then elect the president. But all 14 candidates running against incumbent President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo have accused him of stacking the election committee. One day we shall be reminding ourselves of this struggle and that is when we are on the other side of freedom. So hanging right there, we're also hanging in right there, we'll get the liberation that we deserve. Today we're talking about President Biden's agenda for promoting democracy and human rights in Africa with Nikila James. Nikila was the U.S. ambassador to the Kingdom of Swaziland, now the Kingdom of Eswatini, and later served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Africa and the Sudans until her retirement from the Foreign Service last year. Ambassador James, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Nikila, you worked on Africa for many of your 32 years at the State Department. Before we jump into a discussion around democracy and elections, I wanted to talk big picture. You have seen many changeovers in administrations and policy trend lines. Tell us a bit first about President Trump's Africa policy. How did his administration generally approach the continent? What areas did it prioritize or not? Thank you, Laura. Okay, that's a great question for us to begin with, starting at a new administration. I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that there really weren't very high expectations for what President Trump would do when he came in as president with respect to Africa. He hadn't shown any great interest or knowledge or real concern for U.S.-Africa relations. Um, Once he was in office, it took him about a year and a half to identify an assistant secretary for Africa and almost two years to articulate an Africa strategy. Um, I think it's also worth noting that for many people, when the president... um, called African countries shitholes, that set a pretty bad tone in Africa for what people could expect from the president. And he was coming in behind a president, President um, Barack Obama, who was very popular in Africa. So we start from that low expectations of what the president would do based on his interest and his knowledge. That said, there were a number of really good programs that the career foreign policy um, officials continued and that the Trump administration um, allowed to continue. Some of the most notable programs were the African Growth and Opportunity Act, very important trade preference program, the Millennium Challenge Account, uh, a new way to do large and extended grants for Africa, Power Africa, very important program seeking to expand electrification, the Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI, really important program targeting the best and the brightest of young people on the continent, and I think a really game-changing program, the President's Emergency Plan for, Afri- for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. All of those programs continued under the Trump administration, and that was really the best news, that those programs were not going to go away. President Trump did put in place his own signature program called Prosper Africa. Um, it came on very late, really it only started to be um, unrolled uh, the beginning of last year. So the verdict is really out on whether it's going to be a good program, whether it's going to be an impactful program. But that program is designed to help promote more U.S. investment in Africa, more U.S.-Africa business deals. So we're all looking forward to seeing what happens with the future of Prosper Africa, really President Trump's only signature program. But I think it's worth also noting that there were a few historic moments Um, in Africa that the president was able to um, put the weight of the U.S. government behind. I think the revolution in Sudan stands as one of those big cases where the people of Sudan, the young people, the women of Sudan, decided they were going to change their government, and we were able to be well-poised to support that. 
Similarly, in Ethiopia, when the new prime minister, um, Abi, came in, he was a game changer for the continent and a game changer for the East Africa region. So the U.S. government under President Trump did work very closely with the people of Sudan, the government of Sudan, the people in Ethiopia to support those major changes that have really um, been very positive overall, despite the fact that there are constant challenges. We were able to see positive things happening. So that's in some how many people would see the, the Trump um, years. But of course, the jury is still out. We're waiting to see what happens with Prosper Africa and all of the um, initiatives that will come under that. So how would you describe Trump's policy then? President Trump's Africa strategy had three key pillars. The first one really was about trade. It starts off with trade and commercial ties. Um, the second pillar is it looked at um, supporting, um, countering radical Islamic threats. And the third pillar was ensuring that U.S. taxpayer aid was used efficiently. Nowhere did the strategy focus on human rights and democracy and the things that we had typically come to expect of modern engagement in Africa. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Let's turn to President Biden. He's just been inaugurated and he's building his own team at state. What, if any, changes do you expect from his administration? Well, again, I think the first thing that what people are looking forward to is seeing a different tone and a attitude towards Africa, a more respectful attitude one that involves more partnership, more engagement. I, I think that's something that is a, a natural expectation, um, not only because President Biden himself has been to Africa, he's traveled to Kenya, he's been to South Africa, he knows sub-Saharan Africa, but he's also made some really key personnel appointments that speak to what kind of administration he's going to have. Um, he's appointed Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Ambassador Thomas-Greenfield is somebody who used to be the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, she knows the continent very well, and she's going to be our key diplomat in the UN. That's a really important place because Africa is very, very present in the UN, very active. I remember when I served in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs at State Department, I had the Africa portfolio. I was surprised at how often Africa is in the Security Council. It's not sometimes, it's daily. Almost 60 percent of the work in the African in the U.N. Security Council covers Africa. Um, Africa has the largest number of peacekeeping missions. And of course, the resolutions and the political um, institutions that are set up through the U.N., all of those are going to make Linda Thomas Greenfield's appointment really key for Africa. There are also other key appointments he's made. Samantha Powers heading USAID. She comes with a very strong tradition of support for multilateralism, for understanding the value and the importance of democracy and governance programs. So she's also going to be a key person. Others are career foreign service officers who bring a great wealth of knowledge and understanding the importance of diplomacy in Africa, not just our security um, lens, but bringing diplomatic and development to the fore. So I think those are the things we're going to look for. People like Azra Zaya, who's going to be the Undersecretary for Democracy and Human Rights. Linda, a team at the NSC working on uh, global health and humanitarian issues. And Dana Banks, the newest member working at the NSC as the Africa director. These appointments all speak to valuing career professionals who understand the challenges, who value multilateralism, and who will give Africa the attention that the challenges and opportunities warrant. Um, I think the next thing we're going to see is the focus on human rights, as you said. He's already signaled that by a number of key things he's done. Um, the very fact that on his first day in office, President Biden has said we're returning to um, the Paris Climate Accord, very significant. Climate change is a major challenge in Africa. Young people want to see engagement on climate change in the United States as well as in Africa. So that's what, that was a key indication of what kind of foreign policy we can expect. Similarly, I think returning to the World Health Organization, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. The U.S. has a major voice to play. And so seeing the U.S. return to WHO, where they can work with Africans and others on this global pandemic, very important. So I think those are some of the, the, the key um, signifiers that people have already said President Trump, President Biden is on the right way, is on the right direction. And of course, we're still in, in early days. So uh, as you see, we you don't have an assistant secretary for Africa yet, but we'll get indications um, when that choice is made. But let's flip flip this around a little bit. What do you think the region is looking for in terms of U.S. engagement? And is there a difference among elites versus ordinary citizens? Or what do you think their expectations are? Well, I think one of the first things Africans are going to be looking for generally is showing up. 
showing up matters everywhere, but it particularly matters in Africa where we haven't seen the the full-throated engagement from senior leaders. So people are going to be expecting to see President Biden, Vice President Harris, cabinet members traveling to Africa and inviting Africans to the United States when that's possible. COVID is making that a challenge at the moment, but certainly having that on the agenda is important. President Trump, as I said, in four years, never visited Africa. That's something that Africans remember and talk about. They will be expecting to see um, President Biden as a, sig- as a signal of the value and the worth of African engagement. I think also the, the lifting of the Muslim ban is going to be something that young people are going to be very popular. It's going to be very popular with young Africans because it means African students can return to travel to the United right. States for school. We can have exchanges. We can have academic and university exchanges. All of that came to a halt with the ban on the Muslim ban, which impacted major countries, Nigeria. Nigeria, the most populous country in Africa, was indeed impacted by the travel ban, as was Sudan, Somalia, South Sudan. You can name the countries that were impacted, and lifting that travel ban is something that young people are also welcoming. I think young people are also looking for really a very important thing, which is calling out African dictators. Hmm. I think young people have been signaling for as many years as I've been traveling to Africa, that they want the United States to stand with them in calling out dictators. Um, we've just seen a number of key elections take place, more are coming. Um, let's say we look at the example of, a Niger- of the elections in Uganda. There are many young people who are hoping the U.S. will stand strong with them in their voice to say, we do not want um, these long-term leaders who don't respect term limits, who don't respect fundamental human rights, who violate um, people's basic civil liberties. And so people, I think young people in particular, are going to be looking for the U.S. to take a strong stand in calling out those kinds of leaders. So those would be some of the things. And I would say just in general, upping our game with young people. Um, We are looking for um, a a partnership with Africa where young people are saying, "We um, we want to be at the center of that partnership. So things like ensuring that we're Um, investing more in kind of job creation programs in Africa, education programs, skills training programs. Those are the things that I think young people are looking for. Um, And of course, at the end of the day, um, if we can see also greater investment in health infrastructure, greater investments in countering uh, violent extremism, those are the things that African young people are looking for because they see future in that. I think there are some African leaders who are clearly not so focused on this people investment agenda. And those are the people that we're going to have to decide where does the U.S. stand? Do we stand with those old guard leaderships or do we stand with African young people who want a new, more vibrant engagement with Africa that supports democracy and human rights? And the U.S. and Africa have long intertwined histories. um, But despite this, you know, Africa has long been underprioritized in foreign policy why do you think this is? Well, you know, as an African-American, I come at this with a very particular sensibility. I would have to say that it starts with the fact that the United States has really never come to terms with its own, you know, caste system based on race in the United States. Um, and that caste system devalued African people, it devalued Africa, it devalued African descendants. You can see that from our history, from the slave trade up through the slave codes, chattel slavery, Jim Crow segregation, up to the modern day mass incarceration, under education. You can see the history of our country's involvement with people of African descent. And it's been one that has been undervaluing their humanity and their importance. Um, So basically, I would say say racism has sort of been uh, a central uh, tenet that we have to come to terms with as a country moving forward. Last year, we saw a reckoning on race, on colonialism, structural inequality really sweep across the globe, not just in the United States. How do you see the Black Lives Matter movement informing or impacting foreign policy along the lines that you were just talking about? Well, you know, Black Lives Matter at its core is really addressing the issues of state-sponsored violence against people of African descent, aggressive policing against Black people, to be specific. And that's an issue that has resonated globally because Black Lives Matter speaks not only to that denigrating of Black life in America, but everywhere. They speak to the conditions of Black people everywhere. They've actually spoken out in solidarity with conditions in Ethiopia and Nigeria. And similarly, I think a lot of African-Americans have identified with Africa for the same kinds of reasons. We see this common history of denigrating, devaluing Black life. 
And so you have this long history of solidarity. Um, when George Floyd was killed, the African Union put out a statement. Um, when um, the George Floyd violence was happening, there, were, there was a call from the African group in the UN to address racism in the Human Rights Council. So this issue of solidarity around race issues has been a longstanding one. Um, African Americans have long been a part of the um, pushing our own government to be more engaged in human rights in Africa. You can look at the anti-apartheid struggle as just one example of how African Americans really were at the forefront through Trans Africa, through organizing around the country to encourage our government to be more on the side of right and history in Africa. So you have that history. I personally remember that because going back to my college days, I was a part of those anti-apartheid struggles. And it was really about petitioning our government to do the right thing in Africa. Um, I think that kind of solidarity continues. The Congressional Black Caucus continues to play that role on the Hill. They advocate for good economic and social policies in Africa. CBC has to be giving a lot of credit for having pushed something like a GOA. A GOA comes out of Congressional Black Caucus leadership in large part. So I'd say this history of looking at how our domestic policy and our foreign policy need to be in alignment around the value of African people and African people. Um, and the descendants of African people has a long standing tradition in America. Um, I think one of the things we're also going to see is because President Biden has put a number of um, African descended people in his cabinet and in his government. He's got at least three prominent Nigerians. There's going to be an expectation, I think, from the African diaspora that there will be a strong and a positive focus on Africa. And of course, in mentioning the diaspora, I think. The very fact that the diaspora is growing in the United States, we've got large diaspora populations in Texas, Minneapolis, New York, Maryland. These diasporas inform, engage, um, and participate in the political process domestically, but they also have an eye towards our foreign policy with respect to Africa. So I think all of those are going to come together during the Biden administration to push for a more positive engagement in Africa. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting that another former Assistant Secretary for African Affairs and former UN Ambassador Susan Rice will be head of the Domestic Policy Council, and it'll be really interesting to see how the administration you know, weaves together, as you said, domestic policy, foreign policy, and, and racial equity issues that they've made you know, part of their campaign. We'll be right back to talk about elections in Uganda and Somalia. You mentioned that the Biden administration is likely to refocus on democracy, governance, and human rights across the continent. And this, in fact, comes at a pivotal time for Africa. This year, the continent is expected to hold 26 elections, local, legislative, and presidential. And on January 14th, you mentioned already we saw elections in Uganda happen against the backdrop of concerns about democratic backsliding. As a veteran on this topic, what were you watching in the lead up? And what is your conclusion now that we've seen President Museveni declare the winner for a third term and his major opponent, Bobby Wine, challenging the process as fraudulent? Uganda is a really important country in East Africa. And it's also an important example of the challenge that the Biden administration is going to be confronting. Uganda is a long-term security partner for the United States, and it's also an economic powerhouse in the region and has the potential to do even more. So what happens in Uganda is very significant. It matters a lot. And for decades, the U.S. has had a very close working relationship with President Museveni. He came to power 35 years ago um, following a military coup that removed dictator Idi Amin, and he's sort of been described over those many decades as our development darling. We have worked well with his government. We have supported his um, security forces in their military training because they've been very useful allies for us. Um, uh, Uganda has deployed its peacekeeping effort forces to Sudan, to South Sudan, to Somalia. And these elements have made them a very important security partner for us. So we sort of have a, a mixed bag in our feeling about, uh, a mixed feeling about Museveni because at the same time, he's also, in these 35 years, become very repressive, very um, entrenched in his power and excluding other voices. Mm -hmm. And a voice like Bobby Wine, who represents 
a whole other generation. I think he's about 38 years old. He represents a new, younger generation of Africans who want to see change in leadership. They want to see leadership that's responsive to their biggest needs, jobs, human rights, education, housing. And Museveni, for many of those young people, has just not delivered. He's 76 years old, leading a country that is predominantly young. I think most of Uganda's population, about 70% of its population is under 35. That makes a real disconnect in understanding what people want, how they want those services to be delivered, and actually just giving that, that space and place for young people to be a part of governance. So that's part of the challenge. We we find Museveni very useful as a security partner, but his own people are very critical of him, increasingly so, around his governance and around his his entrenched leadership, which isn't allowing young people to rise to political power at all. Um, the campaign you mentioned with Bobby Wine that just concluded, it was a very violent campaign. I watched it. I watched the, the fact that the internet was shut down, that media was closed, that people were not free to move around, and that there are a lot of people who died. Over 50 people died um, at the hands of security forces. So it was a very violent election. And it just underscored that the challenge of removing entrenched leadership, um, people who've been in office 20, 30 years, is not going to be easy. It's going to be very, very difficult. Um, Museveni won with about 59% of the vote, as you noted. Bobby Wine got about 35%. And Bobby Wine is challenging it because he maintains that it was not a free and a fair environment. And I think anyone who looks at the fact that People were not free to move around, that there was um, police, um, there were police attacks on um, supporters of Bobby Wine. The internet was shut. Um, there weren't election observers. Even the United States couldn't observe the elections. We were not even accredited at the last moment to observe the elections. All of this um, makes the allegations of fraud very, very um, concerning. And so this is going to be an election that's going to be contested in the courts. Um, One of the interesting things I think that we're going to have to also focus on is how do the other institutions of democracy support elections? Mm -hmm. Elections aren't just about voting. It's about whether you have courts that will defend the rights of people who contest, whether there are independent electoral commissions that will review the voting, whether there are parliaments that will speak about these election challenges. So you need to see all of these things coming together. And Uganda is going to be a very interesting case. I saw today that... um, the courts did make one ruling in support of Bobby Wine that's a very telling indication. Um, Bobby Wine's house has been surrounded by security forces ever since the voting happened. That's been the case because they don't want him to receive people. They don't want him to move around and rile up his supporters. That's ostensibly the government's response. Well, they took that to court. Bobby Wine's people took that to court. And today the court said that house arrest that Bobby Wine is under has to be lifted. That's a very good sign that democratic institutions in the country may push back against a very strong autocratic executive like Museveni. So the jury is still out. We wait to see what else happens. But that's an indication that you need strong institutions, not just voting alone. That's going to make the difference. We also have elections in Somalia coming up February 8th. Um, And in a lot of ways, this set of elections is very important for a country that was once considered a failed state. Um, But as I understand it, the election structure is pretty far from one vote, one person ideal that was the original goal. Can you tell us a little bit about how the elections in Somalia will actually work? Somalia is really, really a complicated and a challenging country. Um, When I was the deputy assistant secretary for East Africa, I had the chance to visit Somalia a couple of times. And you come away with this sense of how, how huge this challenge is going to be. Somalia's history has been one of, as you described, a failed state ever since 1991, when the Syed Barre regime fell and the country disintegrated into basically civil war and a long state of violence since then. It's a very clan-based society, so the access to power is clan-determined. And so clan membership has been a big part of the problem and the challenge in trying to move Somalia to a more functioning um, national state. But, this, but despite the many, many challenges, um, there have been many different attempts to try to get it to be functioning as a state. And we now see that in about 2017, President Famajo was selected, and he was selected with the promise that he would help bring one person, one vote to Somalia, something that people had long wanted to get away from this clan-based voting, which really um, disenfranchised 
smaller clans, women in particular. So since 2017, there's been talk about having this one person, one, um, one, one vote, one person, one vote system. There was an agreement made in 2020, early in 2020, that that would be the voting process and that that's how people were expecting things to move forward. But because of the complications of the Klan dynamics and the security threat from al-Shabaab, a major terrorist group in the country, it, it was concluded that it really would be impossible to have this one person, one vote. There wouldn't be the security to do this across the country. There are parts of the country that al-Shabaab definitely has control of. And so because of that, um, the agreement to have the one person, one vote was scrapped for something else. They decided to go to something that would be more an indirect, clan-based process, hopefully more representative, more clans would be a part of it, but still a Mm clan-based system. That concerns many people because, again, it means that women who are not leaders in in those clan structures won't necessarily be a part of that voting process. Young people won't necessarily be a part of it. Neither will be smaller clans. So the system right now, as we understand it, is that these clan members will identify representatives. Those representatives who are part of the parliament will then select the president. So again, we're back to an indirect system. And it's very disappointing to very many people. Um, But I think at the end of the day, for the international community, knowing Somalia's history, knowing that it's made such progress in being once a failed state to at least having a governing system, we're looking for consensus. We're looking for Somali ownership. And if that happens, I believe the international community will basically accept what the Somalis themselves choose as their final voting process. So we're all waiting to see. And quite honestly, the jury is still out on whether it's even going to be an election. There's a lot of talk about how there's so many challenges right now that the vote itself could be the voting itself could be put off. Many people would be very disturbed if that should happen. Somalia does need to have elections to have legitimate government in place. But there are a lot of things that are going to impact whether they can do that. As I said, Al-Shabaab is one of them. COVID is another. And the political infighting, I think, is the third. Let's talk for just a moment about Al-Shabaab. One of Donald Trump's last foreign policy decisions was to order the withdrawal of the majority of troops in the country. What impact, if any, do you think that withdrawal will have on security, politics, development? How will it impact the people there? Well, before I actually talk about that decision, I want to just note up front that the U.S. engagement with Somalia has always been multifaceted. It has to be. It can't be just security and it can't be just military. So to that extent, I'd say we've had We've had a diplomatic presence, recently a development presence, presence and a defense presence. So we sort of have the three Ds operating, as I say. And, you know, that's evident in the right. fact that our embassy returned to be resident in Mogadishu for the first time in about 27 years. So in December of 2018, we opened up, we reestablished a physical diplomatic presence in Mogadishu. That was a very significant step because what we were saying by doing that as a government was that it's important that there be good governance in Somalia, that that's really the long term key to to a stable and a successful and a functioning Somalia. It's not just about having security presence in the country. Um, That platform, that diplomatic platform allowed us to be more engaged with the government of Somalia to work on things like security. Uh, along with other partners, we've been supporting the government there and trying to, one, build up their own capacity to deal with the security threat and to help the African Union and the UN mission there called AMISOM, the African Union mission in Somalia. It is the, if you want to call it the tip of the spear, that's really confronting al-Shabaab along with the Somali National Army. So our presence, the U.S. military presence in Somalia was to help train Somalis and to help Amazon do its work. We were not on the front line. We are not there in active combat. Um, Although I don't think it's a secret to anyone that the U.S. has a drone program that has operated in Somalia, and our presence on the ground allowed us to do that. What President Trump decided to do very late at the end of his his, his term was to um, move the U.S. presence from Somalia. That move has really been... It's really better described as a repositioning and not so much a drawdown. Okay. Um, Those troops, about 700 of them, have been repositioned to other parts of the region. They've been based in at Manda Bay in, say, Kenya. They've been based at our um, uh, our 
uh, Fort, um, Fort Lemonier and Djibouti. So they are in the region to continue to do the support work we've been doing. So I think repositioning is the way to think about it as opposed to withdrawal. For many people, that might be seen as something that's better. It might be more efficient. It may, be, it may put more pressure on the Somalis to step up, to accelerate their timeline for their own security on um, taking over this fight. And so to some extent, it's not, it's, all, it's not an all negative picture that we reposition. It's going to force us to be more efficient and more um, thoughtful about how we engage and how we support the Somalis and the African Union presence there. So I think in some, it's, it's, not, it's not all negative and it's not a total withdrawal by any means. Somalia is also, like other countries in Africa, an area where China, Turkey, and some Gulf states, among others, try to project economic power. I know we can't cover everything in one podcast, but tell us a bit how these influences play out in the Somali context. Now, Somalia is really in a very interesting neighborhood. It sort of is between Africa and the Arab world. It is on the Indian Ocean. It has a huge coastline, about 300 miles of coastline. So it's the Indian Ocean leading towards the Gulf of Aden and then leading into the Red Sea region. So it's a really important area, very important for maritime trade, for security. And so a lot of international um, players are very focused on Somalia for those reasons. Um, They have a lot of international engagement and a lot of development partners. You noted a few of them. Um, In in Somalia, there's a very large Turkish development presence. You also see a lot of European countries. The EU is there. And you also see a lot of, of the Gulf state countries. Qatar is there, the UAE is there, Saudi Arabia is there. And, you know, those Gulf states come to the come to Somalia with um, their own set of issues. And some people have been very critical because they see um, the Gulf states as sort of importing their own rivalry into Somalia. By that, I mean that some of the Gulf state countries have aligned themselves with the federal government of Somalia and others have aligned themselves with the member states. Turkey and Qatar are perceived as being supporters and partners of the federal government with President Fumajo, and the UAE and Saudi Arabia being partners with some of the um, member states, the outlying states. In particular, one of the states, Somaliland, is very problematic because it would like to be an independent state. It is not recognized as such by the African Union, the U.S., or most, most international partners, but yet the United Arab Emirates is signing port deals and trade deals with Somaliland. So you have all of this um, interest in Somalia, a country that's rather unstable, that has a conflict between its center and its peripheries and its member states. And so there's a lot of a lot of competition for influence and power. That's not necessarily good for Somalia. Um, it allows them to play off one development partner against another. And at the end of the day, the question is, will the people of Somalia benefit from all of this engagement and, and competition? So that's one of the issues that, that we're all focused on. Um, the U.S. tries to play a very constructive role. We focus on things like supporting development in Somalia because at the end of the day, we think development is going to be the only solution for stability in, in Somalia and for defeating al-Shabaab, giving people alternative um, livelihoods, giving people um, secure areas to work and live in. And, you know, some of the development partners that are in Somalia don't necessarily have that as their priority. So we're not all on the same page. Um, I think it's also worth noting that China is in the neighborhood, not physically present in Somalia, but China does have a military base in Djibouti, physically right next to the United States military base in Djibouti. And they also look at Somalia and they look at the entire Horn of Africa through their lens of the Belt and Road Initiative. China is very focused on port diplomacy, as we call it, looking at where they can establish ports. So to that extent, Somalia is also an attractive region for them, having a number of ports and having such a long coastline. So Somalia is blessed with um, this geographic um, proximity, but it's also plagued by it as well. I think that's probably the most succinct way to put it. It's a blessing and a curse. And the challenge is for the Somali government to shape a foreign policy and a domestic policy that benefits its own people um, and that to prevent donor and outside external forces dictating what their policies will be. We'll be back in a moment to talk about larger trends in democracy in the African context.
Michaela, I want to zoom back out for this last segment and talk about democracy as a trend line rather than a headline. We've seen democracy under threat around the world over the past few years. How has this trend played out in the African context? Barbara, this is a topic that um, I have not only seen but lived through my foreign service career. I joined the foreign service in 1988, and all of my early assignments seemed to be in countries that in Africa that were ruled by military leaders or had one party rule. So I've watched major change in Africa going from these military governments, one party rule, to really um, um, a burgeoning of multi-party democracy starting in the 1990s at the end of the Cold War. So since the end of the Cold War, Africa has had many, many um, um, elections. Multi-partyism has become the, the norm. And so that's been sort of really the good news story on the democracy and governance front. What we also started to see the emergence of is more independent electoral commissions, um, more legislatures focused on voting inclusiveness, trying to bring more women into the process, more young people into the process. Um, the issue of term limits has been, um, over the last few decades, a very big topic of discussion and debate in Africa, with some fits and some starts. So Africa has made progress on all of these fronts. At the same time, we see some trends of things going backward. Um, I think a couple of organizations kind of track these issues very closely, Freedom House being one of them. Freedom House has been looking at African elections for decades, and they've been, come up with a couple of interesting categories that help us kind of, kind of understand better these trends. They have what they call fully free um, democracies. Only one country today stands in that fully free category. That's um, Mauritius, uh, an island country in the Indian Ocean. And then there are lots of countries that fall into the next category, flawed democracies. These are countries that are democratic, but that have major flaws in some of the determinants of a real democratic system. Then you have the hybrid regimes where you have some democratic institutions, but a lot of autocratic rule as well. And then the last category, autocratic regimes, governments like that in Zimbabwe. Um, at one point, Ethiopia was in that category. I think Ethiopia has clearly worked its way out of that category. But those four um, boxes fully free, flawed democracy, hybrid, and autocratic sort of reflect the spectrum of democracy across the continent. And if you look at the kind of things that they measure, you understand why this is a mixed picture. You can't only look at elections. Elections is simply one barometer, but you've also got to look at how do governments function? Is there good governance? Do they provide services to people? Um, what's the level of corruption like? What's the level of political participation? Is it open and inclusive? Where do women figure in this political pluralism? What's the political culture? Is it violent? Is it, is it um, grassroots? Um, and then, of course, civil liberties. Are people free to speak and to assemble? Um, are they free to form political parties? Those are the kind of barometers that have been looked at to decide whether countries fall into those, five ca those four categories. And I can say it's a very mixed bag. The country that I was the ambassador to, Swaziland, now Eswatini, without doubt it would have to fall into the autocratic category, despite the fact that it has regular elections. It has an absolute monarch. This absolute monarch decides whether there can be political parties, and political parties don't exist. Legal parties can't operate in a country like Eswatini. So that would certainly put it on the spectrum of more autocratic. The king has the last word. The king has the first word. So that's a really big challenge in the country's for the people who live in Eswatini. But across the board, you see a, a variety of countries struggling with these issues and challenging um, leadership on these questions. People have not been passive. Um, you look at a country like Zimbabwe, where I also serve, and you know that that's a country that has had a very violent move towards multi-partyism. When I was serving there, it was just the ruling party, um, uh, the, um, the, the ruling party since the independence days. Now you have the MDC coming up, and they have been a force to challenge that one-party rule there. So there are hopeful examples of multi-partyism really pushing back against those autocratic trends, but it's very challenging, very challenging. Yeah, I was just about to ask if there are any countries in particular that you are watching with optimism when it comes to the strengthening of democratic institutions and values. Well, I mentioned Mauritius because they have been topping the um, agenda for fully free democracy for a number of years now, and that's a really positive sign. But they're a small country, and they're not on the, um, the, the continent of Africa. They are a, con a country in the Indian Ocean. So if you look at the continent, I think the countries I might point to would be a country like Botswana. They have regular, peaceful elections. 
Um, South Africa, certainly a very strong democratic tradition. Um, they have multi-partyism there. Um, and you see in major cities, the opposition parties do win. It's not the ANC that wins consistently. You can look at a country like Ghana, where having come out of a military um, history, they now have very strong multi-partyism. Countries like Lesotho, Namibia, these countries, while they have maybe flawed democracies, they have regular um, indicators that their government system, their governance system is functioning and working. Then you can maybe go down the list of some of the more hybrid cases, countries like Liberia, Nigeria, even Kenya, um, where it's been more problematic and more violent prone history. Um, they still have been able to sustain the practice of having regular elections. So I'd say those that I just named are some of the best examples. And I think we're all hoping that we're going to see good elections in Kenya next year. Kenya holds its next election in 2022. Um, that President Uhuru Kenyatta has agreed to step down and that he is supporting the idea of opposition um, running, that he has been giving strong support to multi-partyism there. That's a good indicator. Um, and Ethiopia is another country that many people are keeping an eye on. Um, Prime Minister Abiy was selected. He was not elected. And, and whether Ethiopia can have good and peaceful elections um, this year will also be a good indicator of whether Africa, large African states are moving towards the positive side of that trajectory. As someone who's shaped policy in Africa, toward Africa for years, but who's now on the outside, what do you see as the ideal role for the United States in this regard? Come down to first and foremost, signaling that we are with the people of Africa, that our programs are supportive of um, investing in people, that means human rights, that means social services. So that's the first and the foremost thing, continuing along with the policies and the programs that invest in African people. Second, I think, is investing in those institutions that support democracy. We don't really have a strong engagement with African parliaments and African judiciaries. Um, and that's a kind of a flaw that I think we're going to need to look more closely at. We've long invested in African elections. We support civic education, we support NGOs, we do election observing, but that's not enough. What we've seen is that we need to support in those institutions that uphold the results of a free and a fair election or that call out what is not a free and a fair election. So we really do need to see building up more support from the U.S. government on independent electoral commissions, um, something that people have been saying is really a, an urgent need because electoral commissions declare whether an election was free and fair. If the Electoral Commission is not strong and independent, and that means independent from the, the governments that support it, then they're going to have a hard time making those calls. So I think we're looking to see that. And then I think our overall commitment to young people is also it's another part of way of supporting democracy. Africa is a continent that I said is very young. 77% of the entire continent is about under 35. In some countries, the median age is 17. We can't even imagine what it means to have a median age of 17. Those young people are looking for the looking to the United States to support their people focused agendas, to focus on governments that are investing in their people and to support the institutions that really are going to provide what they need for their futures. So those are the kind of things that I think the U.S. government should be doing. And, you know, African youth may not be as patient as, say, the generation before them. I think they are less patient. They're more connected. They have extensive social media um, connections. And I think they are going, going to want to see uh, um, a speeding up of these processes of engagement with them in the things that really matter to give them the future that they want and deserve. Makila, last question, which could probably be an entire podcast in itself. We have to touch on the pandemic. You know, we've seen the pandemic worldwide have a significant impact on the process of elections, the outcome of elections, you know, even in countries with older, more democratic more established democratic institutions. How has the pandemic impacted the democratization process in Africa? Yes, this is actually a topic for um, a much longer conversation. Um, but from the democracy lens alone, I can say it's had a devastating impact on the ability of people to do what has to happen for a good election. That's engage in civic education and civic um, uh, programs, campaign, and actually getting out to vote. COVID has prevented much of that from happening across Africa, as it has in many countries. Um, elections have had to be postponed. Ethiopia's election has been postponed from last August to this year. Um, the date's not even firmly fixed, but they've had to postpone because of COVID. Somalia's election as well was postponed to this year because of that. 
um, lesser elections, smaller elections in other countries, Nigeria, Kenya, Zimbabwe, those elections have all been postponed because of COVID for the very reasons I started off with in the beginning. It's very difficult for people to gather in large groups. It's not safe. And government crackdowns. Um, there's also been a number of states of emergency call in several countries. Um, Kenya, Uganda, Guinea, these countries have, have had major restrictions on public gatherings. They've imposed very severe lockdowns in very severe states of emergencies. Now, some of those lockdowns have been looked at by the opposition as targeted towards them and targeted toward preventing their followers from gathering. Um, you know, they've said that COVID has been um, um, used by the government to prevent their people from organizing. And I think there's some degree of truth in that. So you're going to have to look at how those people who were not able to come out, who were not able to organize, were impacted by COVID. But I think also one of the most fundamental challenges that COVID has brought is that it has impoverished Africans more deeply and more profoundly than anything else has in in, in, a, in significant amount of time. Africans who very much rely upon the informal economy have not been able to work. Um, trade and tourism have come to a halt in many countries, and that has impacted people's livelihood. So people are poorer. And as some people say, you can't eat democracy. People need to eat. They need to make a living in order to sustain themselves and their families and to be able to focus on things like voting. So COVID has impacted not just the electoral process, but it's really impoverished Africans even more so. And that's going to be the biggest challenge as Africa works its way out of out of the COVID epidemic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Michaela. We've just begun to scratch the surface of uh, a lot of different stories. And as you mentioned, the economic um, issues in Africa alone will be a whole nother podcast. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The World Unpacked, produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're grateful for your listen and eager for your feedback. We welcome your emails at podcasts at ceip.org. And please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Laura Lucas Magnuson, on Twitter, at Laura L. Magnuson. These discussions are only made possible by our wonderful team behind the pod. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producer is Maya Krishna Rogers. We'll see you next time.